Nancy Jeffries, and I'm not sure who else are in the, on their way to Washington, or at least getting ready to be on their way to Washington for um, the worship. Thank you, the praise and worship thing. And uh, I think Krista and I and the kids might try to sneak up there as soon as church is over. So trying to work that in. Anyway, uh, but it's so good to have you with us today. God bless you. We have a uh, testimony from Brittany today before we take up the offering. So Brittany, why don't you come and share what God's doing? Yeah, I'm kind of nervous this morning, so forgive me. Uh, anyway, I wanted to share a testimony with you guys that happened a few weeks ago, and I've been waiting to share it, kind of waiting to see what happened with it, and the Lord just put it on my heart that I needed to share it with you guys today. So... A um, couple weeks ago, we were here at the church, and it was a Wednesday night, and we were getting ready to leave, and my daughter, Kaylin, tripped outside and fell on her arm and hurt her arm really badly. Um, Pastor Ken was there, so he can corroborate my story. <laughs> but anyway, she fell, and we ran over. We picked her up and everything. We are like, are you okay? And she's like, yeah, but my arm really hurts. And we saw like her arm start to immediately swell in this one spot on her arm, and it was we kind of like looked at each other and we're like, this looks bad. Like this looks like it's probably broken or something. And I picked her up and I took her into the church and I was like coming in to get the boys because they were in here and we we're like, I got to go. I got to take her to the hospital. Like this is wrong. And as I was coming into the church, all of a sudden it hit me. I was like, no, let's pray first. Like we need to pray first before I go, you know, run to the hospital. So we brought her in and we started to pray over and her and things. And man, I prayed like my life depended on it. I don't think I've ever prayed that hard in my life. Um, but we saw the swelling in her arm go down like almost immediately as we were praying. There was a little bit of swelling left. And she describes it as being feeling like really heavy, like her arm felt very heavy. She couldn't move her hand. And by the end of when we were praying, she could move her hand and she could feel her hand again and she could, you know, move everything. And it was, that was amazing. It was incredible. And so I took her home and I like babied her. I just like watched her. I was like, I don't know whether I should take her to the hospital or not. My husband was away for work. It was late. It was like 8, 30, 9 o'clock. I had my boys with me. I'm like, I can't go to the ER right now. Like I can, I really don't want to. I think God healed it. So let's just watch her. Let's take her home. So we put ice on it. I gave her Tylenol and everything. Well, a couple days later, I decided to take her to the doctor because it was still sore. It was pretty sore for her. And we found out that it was broken. At that point, like, my heart was broken, too, because I was like, God, we saw you do it. I saw the, the swelling go down. I saw an arm that was really, like, hanging there working again. I was like, man, I don't know what happened. Well, she ended up having to get a cast on, and she had it on for only three weeks. And when we first got the x-ray, there was like a uh, fracture in her bone. The three weeks, whenever we went back to get the x-ray to get the cast off, there is remodeling across the whole bone, showing that the whole bone was broken at one point. So at one point, whenever we prayed for her, her whole bone was broken. And when we went a couple days later, only half the bone had a crack in it. So... Praise God, she only took three weeks to heal. It's totally fine now. It's absolutely incredible. So it wasn't like that immediate healing that I was like hoping for, but at the same time, I'm like, God, you're awesome because now I have proof. Mm -hmm. I have proof. I have the x-rays showing that it went from a crack to the entire bone is totally healed. So, yeah, anyway. Just Amen. Just yeah. Amen. Thank you, Brittany. God is good. All right, well, we're going to continue worshiping for a moment with our giving. If you have your offering, you can take it out. <clears throat> Amen. Leah, do you want to come and help us? <laughs> come on, Grace. There you go. All right, Grace. Good job. I know, it's intimidating being up here, believe me. All right. We've, uh, Brittany's story seems to be, it kind of seems to be where we're at right now with praying for things and uh, 
you know, we've been seeing God do stuff, but it's like we want to get to that 100%. You know what I mean? And uh, so why don't we just thank God for 100% as we give today? Amen? Amen. Father, we just thank you right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you that you're taking us to a place of complete healing, complete deliverance. Lord, where we see 100%. Lord, that whatsoever thing we ask, believing we shall receive it. We thank you for it, Lord, and we receive it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, ladies. Thank you so much. Well, I want to say, uh, first of all, thanks to everybody who came out yesterday and helped. We had a big crew here. Uh, I know some people showed up um, a little later in the day and we were already done, which was kind of a good thing. Um, but thanks to uh, all of you guys who came and worked. Uh, hopefully you noticed the big difference in the yard when you pulled in. If you haven't taken a look out back, I would strongly encourage you to do that. Uh, most of the yard work was done by, uh, by Matt and his crew. So thanks, Matt, for uh, doing all that. It looks uh, a whole lot better. You can actually see the Votec building from the back parking lot now. There's no longer a forest back there. It's uh, now a field. So uh, we just want to say thanks to everybody. We got the back hallway cleaned and just lots of stuff. There was, I walked into this room at one point, there was five women in here just cleaning. Every, I was like, this room is going to be so clean, you know, and it is. Everything's kind of sparkling today and Krista was kind of in charge of this area up here and they got stuff wiped down, so uh, we're we are germ free for sure, <laughs> no doubt about that. So thanks, guys. Uh, well, kids, you guys can head out. Children's Church. Also, want to say uh, thanks for the. Pastor appreciation stuff. It's not why we do what we do, but it's nice for you to show us your appreciation. I've always looked at it like this. If you weren't here, there would really be no point in what we do. So we appreciate you uh, just as much, even on a day like today where we're missing a couple families. It just, you know, it feels it feels weird when when certain people, most people you look out and you see that they're not here that day. <clears throat> because uh, how many of you know church is a family and it's like showing up for Thanksgiving dinner and, you know, somebody's not there. And it's just, it just uh, feels weird, feels out of place. So we appreciate you guys and we love you. And we're so glad that you chose to be a part of <clears throat> what we're doing here at Alabaster House. Well, um, I'm probably going to be a little shorter today than usual. We used to have a clock on the back wall, but the battery died, and I just chose not to put it back up, so I don't know, you know, how long, how long we go, how long we don't go. So I'm going to see where we go today, and we'll just go with where we go. It's uh, it's really exciting to see what's happening, though, in our the world that we're living in. It, it, how many of you know it, it depends on what voice you turn your tune your ear to, whether you receive hope or discouragement. And I think there was a clear message uh, on Thursday night. I don't talk much about politics, but I think that there was a clear message on Thursday night that our choice is either a dark winter or hope for the future. And as for me, I'm choosing hope for the future. I don't like winter anyway. And especially dark winters. That just doesn't even sound fun. I mean, you can still have fun in the winter time. You know, go ski and go up on top of the mountain, whatever. Go deer hunting. Hopefully there's a little bit of snow for deer season this year. That'd be fun. But I don't want to go hunting in the dark. Like, you can't shoot deer if it's a dark winter. I don't, I don't like dark winters. So how many of you are, you know, hoping for hope, <laughs> you know, 
And, uh, and more than that, like, I'm not doing this Corona thing till 2022. Like, I'm already over it at this point. I'm living my life as if it doesn't exist. And uh, I'm not going to go on for two more years. So, there's good things on the horizon. Amen? Amen? <laughs> and uh, my opinion is, you know, don't listen to the polls. They were wrong four years ago, dead wrong, and they're dead wrong now. Look at, look at the crowd sizes. That's all I have to say. That's all I'm saying. And I'm going to go be in a crowd tonight and tomorrow. So go where the crowd is. I don't know. But I do believe that God's on the move and that he's doing something. He's always doing something regardless of what our external uh, view is regardless of what our external situation is in the old testament it says there was a famine upon a famine double famine but god was still leading his people and providing for them and blessing them and if god did it for them how many of you know he's still doing it for us today regardless of the circumstances around us so don't listen to the intimidating spirit of fear but rather listen to the spirit of life and truth the spirit that leads us into all truth. And how many of you know we need a good injection of truth right now in this day and age that we're living in? And I believe firmly that uh, we are about to see the uprising of the church in a way that we've never seen it before. Uh, I don't look at the situation as though this is, you know, dark and doom and gloom. I look at the situation as though this is an opportunity for light to shine into darkness. This may be one of the greatest opportunities that the church has ever had in in my lifetime, for sure. And we're seeing something transpire today in Washington where there's going to be thousands of people that are gathered in Washington today uh, to worship, to praise, and to pray that God would once again breathe life over our country and bring about a revival. And we need a revival. We need a move of God in this nation. We've had two, uh, you could probably argue, three major moves of God uh, in the history of our country. When I was a child, even in, uh, in our history books in school, we learned about the first and the second great awakenings where God moved in a uh, very powerful way over our country and the, and the dynamics of our country were changed because of what God was doing. And I'm believing that there's going to be a third great awakening and that it's still coming and that we're just on the brink of seeing God once again, move sovereignly over uh, our country, over our nation, and I believe even over the world. Uh, and we're going to see one of the greatest harvests of souls that's ever been brought into the kingdom. Can you say amen? Amen. You should believe that. You should be praying for it. And you should be uh, expecting it. I want to be a part of that. I want to be able to tell my grandkids about the things that God did in uh, in 2021. <laughs> How many of you, like, we're almost there, guys. Just <laughs> It's just a few more weeks away. Hang on. We can make it. But you know, in reality, it, it, in retrospect, you know, listen, 2020 was not a bad year for me. I don't know about you. I mean, yeah, there was like that one month there where we were, I was going out and buying like three months worth of food. <laughs> Remember that? And you couldn't find the toilet paper? Like, uh, it's still hidden somewhere. Somebody has a storage container full of toilet papers that now they can't get rid of. Deb does. I don't know. Somebody's pointing. Bob's pointing at Deb. So she's the one that took it all. <coughs> well, you couldn't, but. <laughs> uh, but I'm like, I mean, even as far as the ch our church is concerned, honestly, 2020 was probably w our best year. In the four years that we've been here, 2020 was probably the best year that we've had so far. And I'm believing for even greater years in the in the days of uh, ahead. But 2020 was not a bad year. It, and what I the way that I view it is 2020 was the setup for what God's about to do. 
2020 was just getting our, our hearts prepared, uh, getting us into the secret place with God. 2020 was uh, getting us ready for what God was getting ready to do. And I believe it's like a slingshot and, and we've been stretched and we've been pulled. But over the next couple of years, you're going to see the effects of that stretching and that pooling. And the church is going to come out uh, in, a, in a very forceful and mighty way. And we're going to destroy uh, the works of the enemy. We're going to destroy darkness. And we're going to see a, a very mighty, victorious move of God. Amen? See, isn't the message of life and hope so much better than doom and despair and, and darkness? Uh, one particular prophet this week uh, prophesied that Trump is going to have be reelected, but but after, I think, the fifth year, an asteroid is going to strike the earth. I'm like, come on, you had it really good there for a minute, and then you messed it all up with the asteroid. It's, I have, listen, I'm 45 years old. I'll be 46 next month. I have survived so many end of the world catastrophes up to this point. Like we, sh I should have a medal, like end of the world survivor. I'm going to make a, a T-shirt that says that. Yeah, uh, but I just like hope, and I like life, and I think that's the message that that the world is attracted to. They're attracted to life, and they're attracted to hope, and they're attracted to joy, and that's the message that should be. Uh, emanating from the church and the people of God, that God is on the move, that God's doing good things, and that this is not the end. It's only the beginning, and our best days are ahead of us. And I said something last week that I didn't get a chance to really dive into, but I told you about the question that God had asked me several years ago when He said to me, if an unbelieving spouse sanctifies a household, then what does the church do for its city. And it was such a profound, revelatory uh, moment that I had had with the Lord. And that verse that uh, I felt like God was alluding to comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14. And it says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. And this is such a, an amazing promise from God. And certainly there's people that fall into this category, and I've met them as a pastor where they are saved, husband or wife, and they're saved, but yet they have an unbelieving spouse at home that they're believing for and that they're praying for. And, and that they're hoping that that individual comes to salvation. And what we have to understand is 1 Corinthians was written as a response, Paul's response to a letter that he had received from the church of Corinth. I wish that we had the letter that they had sent Paul because it would uh, open up a whole other uh, you know, aspect of the conversation. In fact, it's in 1 Corinthians where Paul says that women should keep silent in the church, but he wasn't saying women should keep silent in the church. He was saying your women keep silent in the church because you put rules and regulations on them and you're, and you're keeping them silent. And then he goes on to say, did the word of God come to you only? In other words, the word of God doesn't just come to men, it comes to women also. And that's a, I can preach that message real easy. I've done it before. God loves women. He doesn't want them to be quiet. Maybe sometimes. I don't just say. I'm just joking. But Paul was writing that out of a response that the that the court the church in Corinth had written him a letter and they're asking him questions in this letter. And I believe that that most likely this particular verse and the context of this verse also came out of that letter that Paul was addressing because remember the church in Corinth, they lived in the city of Corinth, which was a Greek city. And these individuals were worshipped in a form called polytheism where they believed in multiple gods. They would have had temples erected around their city, the god of, like the goddess of Diana. Uh, you know, I don't know all the names of the gods, but you know, Thor, I don't know if you're a Marvel hero fan, uh, whoever. But they would have had all these temples erected around the city. 
and people would go and pay uh, homage to their gods, offer sacrifices, and all of these things. And, and now all of a sudden, the gospel comes to Corinth and these people are getting saved and they have a lot of questions as pertaining to how does the gospel apply to me and to my family? And most likely, there was individuals in the church that were saved, but their spouses weren't. And their concern was, if my spouse is not saved, is that disqualifying my household from receiving the blessing and the favor of God that's attached to my life? If, in other words, if I get saved and my spouse is unsaved and I'm learning from the Old Testament and I'm learning about the things of God and how God wants to bless me and how the generations that come out of my life are blessed and how the favor of God is resting on my family and how God wants to use me and He wants to use my family and He wants to fill us all with the Holy Spirit. But the only problem is my family hasn't received Him yet. So if I'm saved and they're not, is that going to disqualify God from him putting his hand upon my family, even though at this moment in time, they don't, they haven't received him yet. Does this make sense? And so the concern was, if I'm saved and they're not, is the favor and the blessing of God still going to rest in my family? And Paul is teaching this out of a concern because he wants them to know the truth. And the truth is, one in Christ is always the majority. One in the family outweighs what the rest of the family is doing. My grandfather was the first one in the boon, on the Boone side to get saved. And the, the Boones were a rough group of people. I know I don't look that rough, and I'm a Boone. But they were rough. They grew up in poverty. Uh, my grandfather carried a chain around with him everywhere that he went before he got saved. His brothers, some of them were alcoholics. Uh, my grandmother was an alcoholic on that side of the family. There was a lot of dysfunction in the family. And God finally breaks through into the Boone family. My grandfather gets saved. And subsequently, not too long after that, he starts to see the rest of his family, his brothers, his sisters, one after the other, receiving Christ, getting saved. And now the vast majority of the Boone family is in the family of God. And it's because one man chose to carry the blessing and the favor of God that rested upon him into the rest of the family. And this is what Paul is teaching. It doesn't matter the condition of your family or where your family came from or the background of your family or how dysfunctional your family is. What matters is that you are in Christ. And because you are in Christ, everything that Christ is, pro is promising you, is offering you, is subsequently transferred from your life into their life regardless of their standing with Christ. Now, I'm not saying that they don't need to be saved. How many of you know they need to be saved? But see, what I know about God is the Bible says it is the goodness, the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. It's not his wrath, his judgment, his anger. Listen, if that was God, how many of you know we would have all been smoked a long time ago? We'd been out of here. I've been out of here when I was 17 years old. <laughs> like... I've been gone a long time ago. And listen, if God didn't do that to you, He's not going to do it to someone else. Because your sin was just as bad as theirs was. You were just as guilty and you were just as deserving of death. But God had mercy on you. God showed you grace. God showed you kindness. And because of that, you received Him. And if God did that for you, He's going to do it for those that you're in, in connected with. In in First Peter, Peter talks to the un, the he talks to the believing spouse. He talks to the believing wife, and he says something similar to what Paul says here. He says, "Those of you wives who have unbelieving husbands at home, let them see the life of Christ in you, at work in you." And paraphrase, when they begin to see the workings of Christ in you, they will begin to long for it themselves. 
Let the life of Christ through your life be an example to them. You know, I've met a lot of spouses over the years, men and women both, and their husbands or wives didn't come to church. And, you know, they go they go to church that day or whatever, and they go home and there'd be their spouse that chose not to go to church. And, you know, they would begin to berate them and tell them you should have been in church today. It was really good and give them a hard time and, you know, whatever. But the instruction from Scripture is just let your life be lived before them and they will want what's on you. They will have a desire because of the peace and the joy that you have is exemplified before them. They will have a desire for themselves to be transformed and to be changed because they will want what you have. I don't know who that was preaching, but it didn't sound like me. Just kidding. Don't watch other preachers while I'm preaching. I'm just kidding. Unless if they're really good, we'll just put them on the sound system and then we'll all get saved. <clears throat> See, it's your life lived. And none of us in this room are perfect and we all make mistakes and especially in marriages, you know, we, we, we're trying our best. But the, but the quality of the Christian life is that those outside of Christ should be looking at our lives wanting what we have. And can we come to the conclusion that maybe for the last decade or so, the world hasn't wanted what the church has to offer? You remember when 9-11 happened years ago? I still remember where I was that day. I was at Wolf Furniture in Belfont. I worked there and I was going into the big room there where they have all the couches and stuff and we had a TV on and there was the news channel on and we walk in and there's the tower and it's smoking. And we stood there for a moment because we didn't know what was happening. And then on live TV, the second plane comes and hits the other tower. And at that moment, we knew this, this was bigger than just an airplane crash. But if you remember back when that happened after 9-11, the next Sunday, the Sunday following 9-11, all the churches were full because people wanted answers and they wanted hope and they, they wanted to connect with God. And they went to church on that Sunday. But the following Sunday, all the churches were back to their normal sized crowd, their regular attenders. The world came into the church, but the church didn't offer the answer that they were looking for. So they went back out into the world. Come on, guys, if we don't have the answer, what do we have? If we don't have hope, what do we have? If we don't have solutions, what do we have? And I believe with all of my heart that in Christ, the church has the ability to offer the world life, liberty, freedom. Freedom in Christ. What we sang about this morning, God has done everything in His power to bring you to a, pr a place of freedom. And it is for freedom that we have been set free. In other words, because we've received freedom, we are supposed to freely give that freedom away to other people. And how do we do that? We teach them what a free life looks like. But when things come against the church and things come against society and the church closes its doors and we're not going to do stuff and we're not having service and we're not going to sing, how are we exemplifying freedom? How are we demonstrating what freedom looks like? Because the way that we give people freedom is by showing them what freedom looks like. Listen, I want to be free, man. And there's a great attack on freedom right now. And so Paul is teaching this and he's saying, the, un, the unbelieving spouse is sanctified by the believing spouse. This is powerful. In other words, the blessing and the favor of God that rests upon the believer is, is transfigured 
to the entire family because of their position in Christ. And and thus, by that, the entire family is able to experience the favor and the blessing of God on their lives because of the family member whose life is in Christ. See, we are supposed to be a conduit of heaven. We are supposed to be bringing heaven to the earth. And Paul is saying that even in the family dynamic, the believer that is in Christ has the ability to bring heaven right into the family. And there's no disqualifying factor. It doesn't matter how bad the rest of the family is, how, be, you know, how bad they are in, in sin. It doesn't matter how bad that brother-in-law is that you have. I'm just kidding. I have two of them here, so I'm picking on both of them at the same time. <laughs> Listen, it, does, it doesn't matter, that family member, that crazy uncle that you don't want to show up at the Thanksgiving dinner, you know. It doesn't matter. Because God's favor and blessing is resting upon the entire family because of your position in Christ. Now they still need to, but this is the reason. Because God is showing them His goodness. He's showing them His grace. He's showing them His favor. And because of that, He is positioning them to receive His forgiveness. And the question was, if the, fa if, if, the, if the unbelieving spouse sanctifies the entire household, then what does the church do for its city? And I believe it's the same thing. I believe that there's, there's no difference. Philip goes down to Samaria and preaches Christ to them and the entire city was filled with joy. Was the city deserving of joy? No, because they were sinners. But the entire city, regardless of who got saved, regardless of who got born again, the entire city was filled with joy because Christ came into the city. Because one believer goes into the city and, and the blessing and the favor that was resting on that one believer is given over to the city. Look what Matthew chapter 5 says. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. Who is? We are. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. See, in the Bible days, salt wasn't just a a, a seasoning, salt was a preservative. Are you with me? They didn't just use salt to season things, they actually used salt to preserve meat, to preserve fish, to preserve these things. And Jesus is saying, we are the salt of the earth. It could also be read as this, we, you are the preservative of the earth. You are seasoning, seasoning the earth. You are preserving the earth. As long as you are here, the earth is receiving something from you. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Who's the light of the world? We are. We like these verses about Jesus. You know, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, right? Jesus said, all things are possible with God. With God, all things are possible. But how many of you know, Jesus also said, you're the light of the world. And Jesus also said, all things are possible for those that believe. So Jesus actually puts us on an equal playing field with what God is doing in the earth in saying, all things are possible for you and you're the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth, 
you have something to do in the world around you. We are preserving the earth and we are bringing light into the world around us. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hidden. One of the greatest presidents in my lifetime, I believe, was Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan said this about our country, that our country was a city on a hill that could not be hidden. And I believe that was a declaration of what God wanted to do over our nation. And as long as the church in America is thriving, the ch- America, the nation, will be that shining example of God's light and freedom into the world around us. But it comes through the church. How many of you know? It doesn't come from government. It doesn't come from normal men. The light of God's grace and kindness and goodness comes to the world through His agent, the church. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And look at this. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Just some people in the house. All who are in the house. And then Jesus says, So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So what's the point? The point is for the light of God to shine through you, for people to see your good works, and as they see God's working in your life, they will glorify God, your Father, who is in heaven. In other words, their lives are transformed because of what is emanating out of your life. Your light. This goes along with what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2. It seemed to have disappeared from my Bible, but here it is. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. And we've been created in Christ Jesus for good works because God has prepared them beforehand that you should walk in them. In other words, God has put a destiny and He's put a purpose on your life. And it's your job to discover what that destiny and that purpose is in Christ. And as you discover your destiny and purpose and you begin to walk it out, you're going to find the good works of God that is created for you in in your pathway. You're going to perform them. And as you perform them, people around you are going to see you living out your fullest potential. And because of that, they're going to glorify God because of what your life is bringing to the world around them. We've been talking to Ethan on and off over the last few. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure that we miss him more than he misses us, but that's a teenager for you. But I asked him a couple weeks ago, I said, Ethan, how's things going? What do you, you know, he's never been away from home for this long. And I said, how are things going? He said, Dad, it was the best decision I've ever made in my life. And as an 18 year old, he hasn't made a whole lot of decisions. (laughs) But I was glad to hear that this decision was the best decision that he's ever made in his life. And that is just an individual beginning to discover the purpose and the plan that God has for them and realizing that God's purpose and plan for them is good, that God wants to use them. 
and that God is leading them to a place where they're discovering the good works of God that he's that he has planned beforehand for them to fulfill. Come on, God has something for you. God has something for your family. God has something for you to fulfill. And as you fulfill your purpose in Christ, it affects everyone around you. It affects not only your family, but it also affects the community that we live in. If an unbelieving spouse sanctifies a household, then what does the church do for its city? Believing spouse. What does the church do for its city? The church, just as the believing spouse, brings the blessing and the favor of God so that God's blessing and favor can still rest upon mankind who doesn't deserve His favor, doesn't deserve His goodness, but because there is a believer there, God's favor is resting upon the community because of what God has done in the life of the believer. Are you with me? So let your light shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Because the church is here, because we're here, God's fa favor and blessing is transferred through our lives into the world that we live in. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I said I wasn't going to be long. I'm going to stick to my promise. So we're going to head to Washington, I believe. So why don't you stand? Listen, I believe today that as people gather at our nation's capital and worship God, that there's going to be a transference as praise. The Bible says that God is enthroned upon the praises of His people. And when we worship and praise, we're creating an environment where God comes and inhabits the praises of His people. And today as believers gather and worship, I believe that there's going to be a shift. There's going to be a move. We may not see evidence of it immediately, but I know that God is going to use this moment to begin to shift things and move things and put pieces into place so that we can see and experience the hand of God in the world around us. So I want to encourage you today, just let today be a day of prayer. Let it be a day of, of worship. Tomorrow is a huge day in our country as uh, they'll be voting on the next Supreme Court Justice. And it's really a time for the church to intercede and pray that God's will is done. So Father, we just thank you today. Lord, we thank you that you've placed us here for such a time as this. God, that you've positioned us, you've positioned your church. And Lord, we believe that your glory and your presence is being placed upon us so that the world around us can see the light of God on our lives. Lord, just as you wrote in Isaiah, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you, and kings shall come to the brightness of your rising. So, Father, we ask you today, Lord, that you would bless America, that you would bless our country, 
Lord, that our best days would be ahead of us. But not only our country, that you would put your hand and that you would breathe upon the church, Lord, once again in a mighty way. Lord, that we can be the agents of transformation in the world around us. That we can be the ones who bring your favor and your blessing into the lives of people around us. So, Father, today we thank you. We bless you, Lord. And we thank you for what you're doing in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. We thank you for it. Now, if you're here today, I want to just take a moment and pray for our, our families. Maybe there's individuals in your family who don't know God, don't want anything to do with God. Maybe there's people in your family who've been hurt, who carry rejection with them, and it's caused them to stay at a distance from God. But today I want to take a moment and just lift them up before the Lord and just declare salvation over them. So I want you to think of that family member. Maybe there's more than one. I want you to just begin to think of them. Maybe it's a mother. Maybe it's a father. Maybe it is a spouse. Let's just lift them up before the Lord and ask God for His favor and His blessing to rest upon them. For His kindness, His goodness to be shown to them. Father, we just thank You for salvation and we declare salvation over our households, over our family members today. Lord, we ask You that Your goodness, that Your kindness would be on display before them that your hand at work in their life would be evident. Lord, we lift up mothers and fathers to you. We lift up spouses to you today, even friends. And we declare salvation over them right now in Jesus' name. Salvation. Lord, let your goodness Invade their lives right now in Jesus' name. Right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we bless them today. We thank you for salvation coming to them right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now just say this with me. Let's just declare something today. The words of Jesus. Say this with me. I am the light of the world. I am a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. I am the salt of the earth. So God, use me. Let your light shine through my life. Let your goodness be on display in my life and let the world around me be affected by what's inside of me in Jesus name amen amen hallelujah if you need prayer today we want to pray for you before you go if you have healing or situations in your life you need somebody to agree with you on we want to pray for you before you go God bless you we love you And it's good to have you here with us today. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys.